Our new government rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery is his natural and normal condition. Our government is the first in the history of the world to be based upon this great moral truth. Go free, I have thought a great deal about the relation of this war to slavery. When the war came, one-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. All knew that this was, somehow, the cause of the war. But my official duty was to save the Union, and not either to save or destroy slavery. The oath I took forbade me to judge the moral question. Until 1862, Lincoln didn't believe he had the legal right to emancipate the slaves. Despite his long opposition to slavery, Lincoln was not a full-fledged abolitionist. Radical leaders considered him too timid, too protective of the rights of slave owners, even racially biased. In his second year as president, Lincoln proved he was still insensitive to the rights of black people. When he advocated a program of recolonizing black families to Africa and the Caribbean, abolitionist Frederick Douglass was incensed. The president of the United States seems to possess an ever-increasing passion for making himself appear silly and ridiculous, if nothing worse. The tone of frankness and benevolence which he assumes in his speech to the colored committee is too thin a mask not to be seen through. The genuine spark of humanity is missing in it. No sincere wish to improve the condition of the oppressed has dictated it. It expresses merely the desire to get rid of them. My personal wish is that all men everywhere could be free. It was on the 13th of July, 1862, President Lincoln first mentioned to Mr. Seward and myself the subject of emancipating the slaves by proclamation. He said he had given it much thought and had about come to the conclusion that it was absolutely essential for the salvation of the Union. In time of war, as Commander-in-Chief, I suppose I have a right to take any measure which may best subdue the enemy. I fear the effect of so important a step. I suggest that you postpone it until you can give to the country a military success. Lincoln agreed to wait for a military victory before releasing the mine shell of his proclamation. The Battle of Antietam was fought on September 17th. For Northern soldiers, it was the most terrifying challenge of the war. The first major confrontation on Union soil. The war's cruelty reached new heights for both North and South. Cavalry and artillery power were used at unprecedented levels. The news came, I think, on Wednesday that the advantage was on our side. I determined to wait no longer. I was then staying at my residence at the soldiers' home. Here I finished writing the second draft of the preliminary proclamation, came up on Saturday, called the cabinet together to hear it, I fixed it up a little Sunday, and Monday I let them have it. Gentlemen, on the first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state or portion of state in rebellion against the United States shall then, thenceforth, and forever be free. It was the words, the ideas toward which his whole life had been directed. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. 
I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. In 1846, I was elected to the lower house of Congress. Even then, slavery exercised the power of making me miserable. As a congressman, Lincoln was exposed to slave auctions and became disgusted by the sight of men and women being treated, as he put it, precisely like droves of horses. He introduced the bill that would have forever outlawed the hated practice in the District of Columbia. It was one of his chief efforts in Congress. The bill failed, and so did Lincoln's attempt to secure a second term in office. He returned to Springfield for the next half dozen years as his law practice grew and thrived. He saddled up old Bob, then launched himself into the life of a circuit lawyer, spending months of each year away from home, traveling the prairies to practice law in local courthouses. During trials, Lincoln was all business, pleading his cases in the slow drawl for which he had become famous. In the evening, when the traveling lawyers gathered together, Lincoln became the center of attention. His tall tales and racist stories continued late into nights filled with infectious, knee-slapping laughter. In the morning, we would all be sore from the excess of laughing. The judge, the lawyers, jurymen, witnesses, and all. Our sides and back would ache all through. One of Lincoln's most memorable court cases involved the trial of Dutt Armstrong, the son of a New Salem friend. He was charged with murder. Lincoln's defense focused on a single witness who claimed to have seen Duff commit the crime under a bright full moon. In the course of the trial, Lincoln called for an 1857 almanac, turned to August 29th, and revealed to the court that the moon had been a mere sliver on the night of the murder. It didn't take long for a verdict of not guilty to come in. When Lincoln was home in Springfield, his headquarters was across the street from the courthouse. It was a second-story rented room that looked out over a back alley. Here, Lincoln and his partner, William Herndon, worked on nearly a third of all cases in the Sangamon County Court. From 1849 to 1854, I practiced law more assiduously than ever before. I was losing interest in politics when the repeal of the Missouri Compromise aroused me again. Now settlers in the West would be allowed for the first time to either establish or exclude slavery as they saw fit. It is wrong wrong in its direct effect, letting slavery into Kansas and Nebraska. Wrong in principle, allowing it to spread to every other part of the wide world where men can be found inclined to take it. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. In March 1857, the Supreme Court held that Dred Scott being descended from an African slave, was not and could not be a citizen of the United States. There was needed but one step further, namely, for the court to say that every state would thus become a slave state. Lincoln threw himself body and soul into the great issue. Over the next three years, as he rose steadily in Illinois politics, he became known as the most reasonable and passionate opponent of the extension of slavery. On June 16, 1858, Lincoln was chosen by the newly established Republican Party to run for the U.S. Senate against the powerful incumbent Stephen A. Douglas. I shall have my hands full. He is a strong man of the party, full of wit, facts, dates, and the best stump speaker in the West. He's as honest as he is shrewd, and if I beat him, my victory will be hard won. On the night of his party's nomination, in a speech more important than any he had ever given, Lincoln called the country a house divided. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free, he insisted. It will become all one thing or all the other. 
house divided against itself cannot stand. In the summer and fall of 1858, Lincoln and Douglas met in an extraordinary series of debates aimed at clarifying their positions for the public. They were Lincoln's greatest days, but in southern Illinois, he would stumble. To survive politically before crowds that opposed full equality for blacks, Lincoln declared that he too favored whites. I agree with Judge Douglas that the Negro is not my equal in many respects, certainly not in color. Perhaps not in intellectual and moral endowments. I have no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the races. Remember that Lincoln was in a racist society where it was easy to tell stories about coons and niggers, and Lincoln did this too. So when Douglas claimed that Lincoln was pushing toward emancipation, Lincoln felt he had to counter by saying, no, he was not in favor of equality of blacks and whites, that in any contest between the races, he would always be on the side of the white man. This was Lincoln at his worst, the most unfortunate period uh, in his whole public career. The positive side was that he shaped the Republican Party and the direction in which it was going. It was going to be a party that, as Lincoln said, was going to put slavery in the course of ultimate extinction. Lincoln's prejudice in favor of whites was overshadowed by a much more deeply held belief that black people were human beings who had a God-given and very American right to freedom. The Lincoln-Douglas debates showed Lincoln as an uncompromising opponent of slavery. Drawing crowds of 10, 15, 20,000 and more, it was oratory, politics, and outdoor entertainment rolled into one. One New York reporter exclaimed, the prairies are on fire. I hold that the signers of the Declaration of Independence had no reference to Negroes at all when they declared all men to be created equal. They did not mean the Negro, nor the savage Indians, nor the Fiji Islanders, nor any other barbarous race. They were speaking of white men. Our fathers left slavery in the course of ultimate extinction. Judge Douglas and his friends wish it to become national and perpetual. He is blowing out the moral lights around us. It does not become Mr. Lincoln or anybody else to tell people that they have no consciences. Judge not, lest ye shall be judged. The Democratic Party has deliberately taken Negroes from the class of men and put them in the class of brutes. I want every man to have a chance. And I believe a black man is entitled to it. I am told a rich black nigger is now traveling this part of the state, making speeches for his friend Lincoln as the champion of the black man. If you think that the Negro ought to be on a social equality with your wives, daughters, and ride in a carriage with your wife whilst you drive the team, then support Mr. Lincoln. This issue will continue in this country when these poor tongues of Judge Douglas and myself shall be silent. There is no reason in the world why the Negro is not entitled to all the natural rights in the Declaration of Independence, in the right to eat the bread which his own hand earns. He is my equal and the equal of Judge Douglas and the equal of every other man. The debates and the national stature they afforded him would help catapult Lincoln into the presidency and give him the opportunity to do what no other president had ever dared consider, legislate slavery off the face of America. On January 1st, 1863, the formal and solemn announcement was made that thereafter the government would be found on the side of emancipation. This proclamation changed everything. 
The Emancipation Proclamation had been duly prepared for the President's signature. As it lay unrolled before him, Mr. Lincoln took this pen, dipped it in ink, held it a moment, and then dropped the pen. I've been shaking hands since 9 o'clock this morning, and my right arm is almost paralyzed. If my name ever goes into history, it will be for this act, and my whole soul is in it. If my hand trembles when I sign the proclamation, all who examine the document hereafter will say, he hesitated. He then turned to the table, took up the pen again, and slowly, firmly wrote that Abraham Lincoln, with which the whole world is now familiar. He looked up, smiled, and said, that will do. We are a good deal like whalers who have been long on a chase. At last, we have got our harpoon fairly into the monster. On the first day of October, just two weeks after the Battle of Antietam, the President, with some others, including myself, started from Washington to visit the Army, reaching Harper's Ferry at noon of that day. His Excellency the President honored the Army of the Potomac with a visit and remained several days during which he went through the different encampments and reviewed the troops. We spent some time on the battlefield where nearly 200,000 men and 500 pieces of artillery were for 14 hours engaged in this memorable battle. It became the bloodiest single day in American history. Thousands of men had either been killed instantly or wounded so severely they were left on the fields to die. Those who could be saved were moved to field hospitals. Here they fought for their lives. Eventually, there would be over one million such survivors. Men disfigured by wounds and amputations. The military career is over now. Men fortunate just to be alive. Passing through one of the hospitals devoted to Confederate sick and wounded, President Lincoln's attention was drawn to a young Georgian stretched upon a humble cot. He was pale, emaciated and anxious, vibrating as it were between life and death. Would you, said Mr. Lincoln, shake hands with me if I were to tell you who I am? There should, remarked the young southerner, be no enemies in this place. Then said the distinguished visitor, I am Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States. The wounded Confederate's eyes melted into tears. President Lincoln bent over him, motionless. His eyes, too, were overflowing. In all, 23,000 had been killed or wounded at Antietam. Nearly 60% were Union soldiers. The hailstorm of blood and death had been too much for General McClellan. Angry and frustrated by McClellan's refusal to pursue the enemy, Lincoln sputtered that the Army of the Potomac should be renamed McClellan's bodyguard. McClellan is constitutionally too slow the president's patient is at last completely exhausted with his inaction and never-ending excuses. October 6th, to McClellan. The president directs that you cross the Potomac and give battle to the enemy or drive him south. Your army must move now while the roads are good. October 24th, to McClellan. 
I've just read your dispatch about sore-tongued and fatigued horses. Will you pardon me for asking what the horses of your army have done since the Battle of Antietam that fatigues anything? November 5th, by direction of the President of the United States, it is ordered that Major General McClellan be relieved from command of the Army of the Potomac and that Major General Burnside take command of that army. A group of Indians called today upon their great father. The tycoon amused them immensely by airing the two or three Indian words he knew. I was amused by his awkward efforts to make himself understood by speaking bad English. For example, where live now? When go back, Iowa? Lincoln had grown up with some limited awareness of American Indians. But as president, he paid little attention to Indian affairs until the second half of 1862. All eyes suddenly focused on Minnesota. Here in the land of 10,000 lakes, whose morning mists had for centuries enshrouded the Sioux in their forests of teepees, white settlers continued to pour in and occupy ancestral hunting grounds. Finally, a major confrontation erupted. In the month of August, the Sioux Indians in Minnesota attacked the settlements in their vicinity with extreme ferocity, killing indiscriminately men, women, and children. How this outbreak was induced is not definitely known, and suspicions, which may be unjust, need not be stated. It was the bloodiest Indian uprising in U.S. history. General John Pope, assigned to the area, declared in response, it is my purpose utterly to exterminate the Sioux. Receiving word of an upcoming mass execution of more than 300 Indians, Lincoln intervened personally. I immediately telegraphed to have transcripts of the records in all the cases forwarded to me. Anxious not to act with so much clemency as to encourage another outbreak on the one hand, nor with so much severity as to be real cruelty on the other, I caused a careful examination of the records of trials to be made. I then ordered 39 to be executed. Lincoln wrote in his own hand the names of the 39 condemned Indians, spelling them out phonetically so that no mistake could possibly take place. With the white population crying out for vengeance and vigilante squads pledging themselves to execute all the Indians, Lincoln's moderating wishes were carried out on the day after Christmas. Mr. President, I have the honor to inform you that the Indians and half-breeds ordered by you for execution were hung yesterday at Mankato at 10 a.m. Everything went off quietly, and the other prisoners are well secured. It was the largest mass execution in U.S. history. It occurred in the wake of a huge Union defeat, Burnside's disaster at Fredericksburg. With almost 13,000 new casualties, Fredericksburg became a new low point in what many were now calling Lincoln's War. In the midst of these crises, Lincoln suddenly faced treachery right in his own administration. Treasury Secretary Salmon Chase had secretly riled up a powerful group of senators by telling them that the cabinet was in shambles. No one could agree on anything, and Seward, in particular, was hurting the war effort. It was his attempt to force the president not only to fire Seward, but to clean house altogether. Their game was to drive all the cabinet out, then force Lincoln to form a cabinet around Mr. Chase. To protect Lincoln, Seward resigned. Refusing to accept the resignation, Lincoln decided to trick Chase into showing his true colors. Secretly, he called a joint meeting between the senators and the cabinet. Chase would now have to either publicly repudiate his president or take back the allegations he had made behind Lincoln's back. I feel trouble in the air before it comes. The committee is to see me at 7 o'clock, and they wish to get rid of me, too. I'm half disposed to gratify them. On Thursday evening, all the cabinet except Mr. Seward called on the president at his request. 
Chase, Blair, and Bates made speeches. Mr. Chase, among others, stating that the cabinet members were all harmonious. I asked Judge Colomer how Mr. Chase could venture to make such a statement in the presence of the senators. He answered, he lied. Humiliated, Chase now wrote out his own resignation. Let me have it, said the president, almost grabbing the paper from Chase's hand. Then, surprising all, Lincoln refused to accept the resignation of either Seward or Chase. He said, with a good deal of emphasis, he was master. I do not see how it could have been done better. If I had yielded to that storm and dismissed Seward, the thing would all have slumped over. When Chase sent in his resignation, I saw that the game was in my own hands. For once in my life, I rather gave my temper the rein, and I talked to those men pretty damn plainly. The cabinet crisis of December 1862 was a turning point in Lincoln's administration. As a result of it, the leaders of both the conservative and the radical factions of the Republican Party, Seward and Chase, stayed in the cabinet, and Lincoln was unquestionably the master of his own administration. Shortly after the cabinet crisis was over, Lincoln told a friend that he was reminded of his early days in Indiana when he had tried to carry pumpkins while riding a horse. The only way he could do it was to put a pumpkin in a bag on one end side of the horse and another pumpkin on the other side in balance. Now, thinking of Chase on the one side, of Seward on the other, he said, I have a pumpkin in each end of my bag and I can ride. To brighten the winter afternoon, Lincoln requested a visit with Commander Foote, a performing midget. He had heard about him from another tiny man he had brought to the White House, Commodore Nutt. Both were employees of America's greatest showman, the irrepressible Phineas Taylor Bonham. His American museum lay across the street from the Astor House in New York. On their stay there in 1861, Mary Lincoln hadn't been able to resist taking the boys over to see Bonham's wonders. The most popular attraction of all was the world-famous midget Tom Thumb. His highly publicized New York wedding was the social event of the year. On February 13th, Thumb had come to a special White House reception with his bride, Lavinia Bumpus Stratton. The president thought she looked remarkably like Mary Lincoln. The pygmy general wore his elegant wedding suit and his wife her wedding dress. It was pleasant to see their tall host bend and bend to take their little hands in his great palm, holding madams with a special chariness, as though it were a robin's egg and he were fearful of breaking it. His sense of the ridiculous was so keen that it bore him up from difficulties that would have broken down almost any other man. But that he gave way to uncontrollable fits of grief in the dark hours of the war is a fact beyond question. <laughs> The winter of 1863 passed rapidly and bloodily. At night we sleep on the cold, cold ground Where there's no lodging to be found Sometimes it rains, sometimes it snows the icy wind around us blows. Lincoln continued his search for the right commander for the Army of the Potomac. A month after the disaster at Fredericksburg, Ambrose Burnside was turned out of the job. Now Lincoln appointed a rough, ambitious, hard-drinking soldier known as Fighting Joe Hooker. Major General Hooker, I have placed you at the head of the Army of the Potomac. Beware of rashness, but with energy and sleepless vigilance, 
Go forward and give us victories. But instead of victories, Hooker brought more defeat. In early May, boasting that his soldiers would destroy what he called the Confederate ragamuffins, Hooker led his men into one of the worst bloodlettings of the entire war, the Battle of Chancellorsville. About three o'clock in the afternoon, the door opened and Lincoln came into the room. He held a telegram in his hand and in a voice trembling with emotion said, Read it. News from the Army. The result of the fighting at Chancellorsville. Clasping his hands behind his back, he walked up and down the room saying, My God, my God, what will the country say? What will the country say? Lincoln's presidency now came under heavy criticism for his infringements of civil liberties. They included the silencing of opposition newspapers and the arrest of public agitators. Men like former Ohio Congressman Clement Vallandigham. His repeated anti-war activities and speeches finally forced Lincoln to banish him to the Confederacy. Must I shoot a simple-minded soldier boy who deserts? while I must not touch a hair of a wily agitator who induces him to desert? I think that in such a case, to silence the agitator and save the boy is not only constitutional, but a great mercy. Despite army setbacks, Lincoln's naval blockade of southern ports was finally having its effect. The Confederacy was beginning to run out of food and supplies. The tables were now beginning to turn. Our numbers were less than the federal forces, and our resources were limited, while theirs were not. The dark clouds of the future then began to lower above us. Late in June, Lee decided to gamble all on a second invasion of the North. At the White House, Lincoln pushed pins into a wall map as he charted every move. Major General Hooker, if the head of Lee's army is at Martinsburg and the tail of it on the plank road between Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, the animal must be very slim somewhere. Could you not break him? When Hooker failed to pursue Lee, Lincoln was through with him. Hooker's command had lasted just four months. He was replaced by General George Gordon Meade. No one ever received a more important command, wired General Halleck, speaking for Lincoln. The words bore little comfort as Lee's armies began to come down from the mountains and converge on a sleepy little Pennsylvania town called Gettysburg. So much has been said about Gettysburg that for me to attempt to say more may only serve to weaken the force of that which has already been said. When Lee crossed the Potomac and entered Pennsylvania, followed by our army, I felt that the great crisis had come. I knew that defeat in a great battle on northern soil would mean the loss of Washington to be followed perhaps by the intervention of England and France in favor of the Confederacy. The burden was more than I could bear. Suddenly, almost by accident, in a little Pennsylvania town that made carriages, two great armies came face to face. It was the showdown of the war. Whoever won here might well claim victory over all. And Lincoln knew this. The losses at Gettysburg over the next three blistering hot days were staggering. 
17,000 on day one. 16,000 on day two. By nightfall of July 3rd, it was all over. Lee had failed and was beginning to withdraw. I asked God to give us victory, and I was sure my prayer was answered. People claim that Lincoln was not willing to end the war, that he was bloodthirsty, that he ordered his generals into devastating campaigns that caused immense amount of suffering and loss of lives. He gave fierce orders that his generals war to fight it out. They were to choke and grab until the beast was dead. They were to hold on while skinning the Confederate animal. This is all true. But could Lincoln have done anything else? Of course he could. He could have negotiated a peace at any point. It was a peace that would have involved the dissolution of the Union and the permanency of slavery. The question then is simply whether war was worth the cost. That's a question no one can answer for everybody. Lincoln answered that it was God's will that this fight continue until liberty and union were preserved. At Gettysburg, once quiet farmland had become a huge emergency field hospital. Long tables had been set up in the woods for amputations. Embalmers set up shop in makeshift tents and barn buildings, as they did beside so many battlefields in this war. The ground is covered with the dead, while the air is poisoned with odors from the festering corpses which lie on the green earth, or are but imperfectly buried beneath. The imagination revolts, but it is one of the inevitable parts of this horrid war. Now out of a profound need to bring sense and order and reverence for life to this unspeakable chaos and horror, the idea was born for a special military cemetery right here on this fighting ground. Lincoln's attention, however, remained riveted on Lee's retreat. The president said this morning with sadness and despondency that Meade still lingered at Gettysburg when he should have been cutting off the retreating army of Lee. About noon came the dispatch stating that our worst fears were true. The enemy had gotten away unhurt. The president was deeply grieved. My dear general, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within your easy grasp, and to have closed upon him would have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged indefinitely. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed immeasurably because of it. To press the war to a successful conclusion, the Union needed men, and more men. To get them, Lincoln created the draft, and many didn't like it. Men can be had only voluntarily or involuntarily. Shall we shrink from this? Are we degenerate? Has the manhood of our race run out? I must have men. Why does the government reject the Negro? Is he not a man? Can he not wield a sword, fire a gun, march and countermarch, and obey orders like any other? If persons so humble as we can be allowed to speak to the President of the United States, we would tell him that this is no time to fight with one hand when both are needed. That this is no time to fight with only your white hand and allow your black hand to remain tied. A man drowning would not refuse to be saved even by a colored hand.
active recruiting of blacks had begun in the spring at Lincoln's request. The bare sight of 50,000 armed and drilled black soldiers, Lincoln declared, would end the rebellion at once. In spite of the fact that Lincoln was slow to agree to equal pay, by summer, black soldiers were becoming heroes on the battlefield. Frederick Douglass' son, Lewis, was part of the attack on Confederate Fort Wagner, South Carolina, by the colored Massachusetts 54th Regiment. We charged that terrible battery on Morris Island known as Fort Wagner and were repulsed with the loss of many killed and wounded. It was terrible. Not a man flinched. I wish we had a hundred thousand colored troops. Then we could put an end to this war. Before the war's end, there'd be more black soldiers in the Union Army than all the soldiers fighting for the Confederacy. Lincoln himself was changed by these brave new troops. From this point on, any lingering doubt he might have had about the black man's place in America was swept away. During the summer and fall, some of Washington's finest photographers, including the master himself, Matthew Brady, strayed from their galleries to photograph the battlefields of previously unknown Gettysburg. Battle-scarred homes, makeshift field hospitals, streets or hills or plots of woods where battles raged, fallen boys still lying there now enshrined in the collodion of a photographic plate to be forever remembered. The New York Times reported, if Brady has not brought bodies and laid them in our dooryards and along the street, he has done something very like it. Work at the new National Cemetery at Gettysburg was going forward steadily. Black laborers exhumed 60 bodies a day at $1.59 each. They moved them in pine coffins to the new burial grounds. The proposition to ask Mr. Lincoln to speak at the Gettysburg ceremonies was an afterthought. The question was raised as to his ability to speak upon such a grave and solemn occasion as that of the memorial services. The invitation for chief speaker at Gettysburg went not to Lincoln, but to the grand old New England orator, educator, and statesman, Edward Everett. It is the desire that after Mr. Everett's oration, you, as chief executive of the nation, formally set apart these grounds to their sacred use by a few appropriate remarks. These few appropriate remarks Lincoln now commenced to formulate and ponder. My husband was 14 years and 10 months older than myself and was from my 18th year always lover, husband, father and all, all to me, truly my all. Mrs. Lincoln's love for her husband sometimes prompted her to act very strangely. She was extremely jealous of him, and if a lady desired to court her displeasure, she could select no sure way to do it than to pay marked attention to the president. I do not approve of flirtations with silly women. I have a great terror of strong-minded ladies, and I never allow the president to see any woman alone. Actually, Lincoln was extraordinarily attractive to women. They vied to be close to him, to hear him talk, and to be stared at by those tender gray eyes. He, in turn, was deferential, respectful of the opposite sex, a bit leery, but also drawn to them. It was a thrill for him to be acquainted with some of the most beautiful women of the age. Among them, the vivacious Kate Chase. 
Salmon Chase's coy but ambitious daughter Kate at times seemed to outshine the first lady. Mary Lincoln instructed her husband not even to talk at receptions to the bewitching 21-year-old beauty. She could not abide what she called his flirtations. But mother, I insist I must talk with somebody. I can't stand around like a simpleton and say nothing. On the day of Kate's wedding to New England's richest bachelor, Lincoln left the White House alone, bearing a small fan as a wedding present. Mary remained at home with the convenient chill. This was less than a week before the president's scheduled departure for Gettysburg. Colonel Lamon was called on to act as marshal on the occasion of dedicating the cemetery at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Mr. Lincoln told me that he would be expected to make a speech on the occasion. From his hat, he drew a sheet, one side of which was closely written with what he informed me was a memorandum of his intended address. This he read to me first remarking that it was not at all satisfactory to him. To reach beyond the ghastliness left by the Gettysburg battle and find words that would give hope for the future. That was Lincoln's task. After examining a plan for the new cemetery, Lincoln sat writing at his desk shutting out all noise with his great concentration. His thought processes were slow. His memory, extraordinary. His mind is like polished steel, said his friend Joshua Speed. A mark once made upon it is never erased. To Lincoln, the written word was humankind's greatest invention. Enabling us, he said, to converse with the dead, the absent, and the yet unborn. The more he pondered, the more he believed that God had created all human beings fundamentally equal. Today, as he wrote about this, a fine and powerful glory was in his pen. Thousands had streamed into Gettysburg for the great occasion, and town hotels and private dwellings alike were filled to overflowing. As the parade approached down Baltimore Street, the military units were in the lead, the president and dignitaries just behind. Every minute along the way, a cannon was fired. In moments, the marchers would arrive at the new cemetery at the outskirts of the little town where today the eyes of the nation were focused. The band played with great effect. Mr. Everett then arose and without notes of any kind, pronounced an oration. He occupied two full hours in the delivery. Then Marshal Lannan introduced the President of the United States. The occasion was solemn, impressive, and grandly historic. The people stood spellbound, and the vast throng was hushed and awed into profound silence. I, a boy of 15, stood with my heart in my mouth, literally at the feet of my hero. I could look directly into Lincoln's face. Its deep lines, the wrinkled brow, the deep-set brooding eyes burned indelible images into my memory. Then Lincoln began to speak. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in the great civil war, 
testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Mr. President, I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. I am pleased to know that in your judgment, the little I did say was not entirely a failure. The Gettysburg Address is simply unparalleled as a public document. It owes much to Lincoln's legal training, which gave him the conciseness of language the absence of rhetoric. It is especially effective because it combines Lincoln's personal beliefs with strong national values. But this does not explain the Gettysburg Address. One can't do that. You simply have to admire its genius. On November 9th, Lincoln treated himself to a night out at Ford's Theater. At the middle of his presidency, with 17 grueling months still ahead of him, Lincoln came to watch a play called The Marble Heart, the story of a Greek sculptor whose statues of beautiful women came to life. Cast in the lead, it was a passionate, smoldering-eyed, unstable young actor from Maryland named John Wilkes Booth.